What if I told you that all this time, mythical Pokémon have been giving us hints to what the next generation will be? And now, if that is true, what does it tell us about Gen 9? Now, what are mythical Pokémon? Well, mythical Pokémon are special, legendary Pokémon that cannot be obtained through normal gameplay, with some later exceptions. Some are obtained through special events, mostly the releases of new Pokémon movies, while others need special items that are distributed online through the mystery gift system, or even in person at stores that are hosting the event. And have you ever noticed that some of these mythical Pokémon don't always seem to fit the theme of the generation they were introduced in, but do fit kinda well into other others? Particularly the following generation of games? I mean, it makes a bit of sense. Mythical Pokémon tend to have their events much after the game's re first release, so Game Freak would of course be working on the next game already, but it does make me start to think. Dangerous, I know. But are Mythical Pokémon sort of hints to what the next game might be about? Well, perhaps if we look into their designs, we can solve this mystery gift that was given to us. Now, real talk time, uh, let's be serials for a moment. Is this the mess you get when you try to make fancy breakfasts? Well, then it sounds like you need Magic Spoon! With Magic Spoon, you get all of the convenience of cereal because it is cereal. But it's guilt-free cereal with zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Also, only 140 calories. When it comes to keto, grain-free, sugar-free cereals in general, they all either fall into one of two issues. They either turn into powder in your mouth, or they're so rock solid no matter how long they soak. But Magic Spoon, it must be magic because it's perfect. I love to just munch on it straight out of the box. And right now, you can build your own variety box and use my coupon code LOXTON for $5 off of that order by following the link in my description. That's right, choose any four flavors to try. Personally, I'd recommend Frosted, Fruity, Cinnamon, and Blueberry. Those are my four favorites. But that might change because they just introduced these two and I'ma try them. Now, there are quite a number of mythicals to get through, so let's tackle them by generation. And since we're still in the middle of Gen 8, let's start with the mythical Pokémon of Generation 7 and move our way backwards, because clearly they wouldn't have gotten this idea until quite a few sequels in. Pokémon Sword and Shield, based in Galar, which is based on Great Britain, the world leader of the Industrial Revolution, and it features the Dynamax gimmick. Versus Pokémon Sun and Moon, based in Alola, which is based on Hawaii, a tropical paradise where Z-moves are a-happening and aliens in the form of Ultra Beasts are invading. Now, which of these do you think Magirna fits better into? Or Melton? Yeah, see what I mean? So, the mythical Pokémon of Generation 7 are Magirna, Marshadow, and Zeraora, as well as Melton and Melmetal. If our idea here is correct, then these Pokémon would foreshadow Sword and Shield in some way. And with Magirna's... just design... <laughs> It's all too clear. Magirna is certainly based on man-made automatons dating back to the Renaissance period of European history. So right away we're pointed to a return to Europe as the setting for Generation 8. But that may be still too general, so let's see if we can narrow this down. Its design is also based on maids who were employed by many European aristocracies. And while France comes to mind thanks to the concept of the French maid outfit, maids are also often associated with British culture culture, as seen in shows like Downtown Abbey. Plus, as mentioned, it's a bunch of gears, like Motostoke City, because again, England spearheaded the Industrial Revolution. Oh, sure, Magirna's signature move is Fleur Cannon, which sounds like it comes from Fleur de Lis, Fleur de Lis, which is a heraldic design that's particularly associated with French royalty, so it seems to point a bit more towards France previous game, but I think it still is safe to say that it points towards royal, noble Europeans as a whole, thus it hints to a return to Europe. And maybe not much else, but it's only one of the five mythicals, so perhaps it's just a piece of this puzzle. 
So what do the others say? Next up is Mars Shadow, who, unlike a lot of mythicals, does fit the region it's in quite a bit, as one of its inspirations are the Hawaiian Night Marchers, and that seems to have nothing to do with Europe at all. Much less Britain, right? Well, yes, but let's shift our perspective here and look at this Pokédex entry from Ultra Sun. It slips into the shadows of others and mimics their powers and movements. As it improves, it becomes stronger than those it's imitating. Thus, clearly one of Mars Shadow's other inspirations is the entire higher concept of shadow boxing. Shadow boxing is an exercise practiced by, wouldn't you know it, boxers, where they go through the motions of their routine as if they have an opponent in front of them. Now, while the concept of boxing itself goes back to ancient times, modern boxing as a sport with rules can trace its roots right back to Britain back when they used bare knuckles and people died. But modern boxing with its protective padding and rules was invented in 1743 by Jack Broughton, an Englishman. And also, also, Marshadow's general martial arts theme could also foreshadow the martial arts vibe of the entire Isle of Armor, especially with its Southeast Asian warrior helmet design fitting in quite nicely. Zara Aura. Now, this piece of furry bait is really interesting as it uses the pads on its paws to generate a magnetic field which it uses to levitate and move at high speeds. And what comes to mind when I hear that are the Japanese bullet trains which use magnetic levitation, or maglev technology. But the first commercial use of which was in Britain. And speaking of furries, their modern history goes back to the underground comic scene of the 1960s which originated in both the US and the UK. A bit loose, but moving on, lastly for Gen 7 Mythicals, Melton and Melmetal. The design of these two, just like Magirna, referenced the Industrial Revolution which began in the UK. This was also the time when a neurological disease called erethism became prevalent, and erethism is caused by mercury poisoning, an all too common ailment among English hatters, which is why it is also known as Mad Hatter Disease. You're probably thinking about the Hatter in Alice in Wonderland now, huh? Particularly because it's on screen right now, but also bonus fact, that book was written by an Englishman too, sealing the Mad Hatter into pop culture. And plus, to top this all off, Melmetal is the only mythical Pokemon to get a Gigantamax form, almost as if it were made for this game. But moving on, if this idea were to hold true, then that would mean the Gen 6 mythical Pokemon would have to vaguely hint to the Gen 7 games. So is that the case? Like it all? Moving on to the mythical Pokémon found in Kalos, we have Deontay, Hoopa, and Volcanion. And what do they tell us about the then-unknown Gen 7 games? Well, overall, these ones are very simple. Deontay is just decorated in pink diamonds, crystals, and the whole gimmick of Sun and Moon were the Z-moves which were possible thanks to Z-crystals. And the whole game has you constantly collecting them. And then, Hoopa's whole gimmick is that it uses hoops to make portals and wormholes, as indicated by its signature move, Hyperspace Hole, and it's not even from the world it's in now. It's from some unknown world, at least according to its movie. And, well, the main plot point of the Gen 7 games was all about ultra wormholes. Ultra beasts coming from ultra space from other worlds. That's like one-to-one -one hint bait! And Volcanion is all about steam and volcanoes. Volcanoes are really all over the place in the world, but Hawaii wouldn't even be there without volcanoes. The volcanoes are the islands. Though of course, because Carlos is French and France has volcanoes, you could say it's just that. But hang on, the most the most volcanically active zone in the world is the Ring of Fire around the Pacific Ocean. It makes you wonder if Volcanion's arm vent things are referencing that because it's a ring. There is no other reason for it to look this dumb. So what do we got? What are the hints hinting at? A Pokemon game with crystals and wormholes that takes place in the volcanic Ring of Fire? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Victini, Keldeo, Meloetta, and Genesect are the mythical Pokémon from Unova. If this idea holds true, they should all somehow hint towards the Gen 6 games, X and Y, which take place in Kalos, based on France. And Keldeo is already perfect. It's based on the character D'Argnon, D'Artagnan, D'Artagnan, D'Artagnan. It's based on the character 
this guy, the youngest member of the Three Musketeers from the French adventure novel of the same name, which was written in France and is based in France. How perfect. Victini, the victory Pokemon, actually has a pretty strong connection to France. For starters, Victini is found in Liberty Garden, which is based off of Liberty Island in New York City, on which stands the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty was a gift to the United States from France and was partially constructed in France. But that's not all. Victini's association with the letter V, as well as it doing a V sign with its little tiny fingies, actually goes back to World War II. First, the V sign is a reference to the V campaign, which was created by, wait for it, Victor de Lavalai. As a radio broadcaster, he called for his fellow Belgians to start using the letter V to rally the people, as it was the first letter for victory, which is victory in French, it's just spelled differently, as well as Vrijheid, which is freedom in Dutch. Thus, this V sign was created as a part of this campaign, and this was later picked up and used by Winston Churchill as seen in some pictures, and then it was used in many promotional materials throughout the Allied nations, which of course course points us to a hint that the next game is in Europe. But more than that, Victini could also be a reference to V-Day or V-E-Day or Victory in Europe Day, which was the formal and official day World War II ended in Europe. Moving on to Meloetta, we see that it has two forms, Aria, its original form, and Pirouette, its alternate form. Arias are self-contained pieces of music made for one voice and during the late 17th century evolved into two different forms, binary and ternary. It's possible that Meloetta references binary form, since it itself has two different forms, and notably binary form became very popular among French Baroque opera during this time. A pirouette, then, is a type of dancing turn used commonly in ballet, and ballet, while originating in Italy, became especially prominent in France and Russia following the Italian Renaissance. In fact, the very first professional ballet company started in France. The Paris Opera Ballet. And lastly, Genesect. Genesect is much like Deonce and Hoopa in that it doesn't foreshadow the setting of the next games, but a plot element. Genesect was an ancient creature that was modified by humans to become the most powerful Pokemon, and it has a giant laser on its back. An ultimate weapon, if you will. What do we find in Kalos? An ancient device that was modified by a human to become a giant laser? The ultimate weapon? Wow. And next we have the Sinnoh region, which has the most mythical Pokémon in a single generation. Or that is, if you consider Fion to be a mythical Pokémon, which a sizable number of people in the community dispute. If not, then that just means it's tied with Unova. But anyways, those Pokémon are Manaphy, Fion maybe, Darkrai, Shaman, and Arceus. Do they at all hint at Pokemon Black and White? Okay, so for the sake of this video, we are going to include Fion, since the rationale I'm about to explain can apply to both Manaphy and Fion. So, if you are one of those people who think Fion should not be a mythical Pokemon, that's fine. It doesn't break this thing at all, because it all applies to Manaphy. Anyway, Manaphy and Fion are the Sea Guardians. Everything about them is all about the seas and oceans, and if I recall correctly, in the marketing campaigns leading up to Gen 5, it was mentioned that the new region was very far away from Sinnoh, specifying that there was a large ocean separating the two. And it is! Unova is the first mainline Pokémon region based in the United States, a place Japanese folks often refer to as overseas, because it is. And even Manaphy and Fion's category as the seafaring Pokémon and sea drifter Pokémon allude to this, since the American continents were discovered by seafaring Europeans, and the vast majority of them had trouble at sea, and would have to drift the rest of the way there. Then, Darkrai. By itself, Darkrai's whole shtick is dreams, which could very well be a call forward to the whole dream world gimmick of Gen 5. However, if we bring in its partner of the lunar duo, Cresselia, we also have another potential foreshadowing with how both represent duality, dark and light, 
or black and white. And again, just like with Fionn, this still works without needing to involve Cresselia, but I included it anyway as I thought it was a pretty good connection. Now Shaman is tricky. At least that's what I thought at first. Shaman is always tied to themes of gratitude, and while that could connect to something like Thanksgiving Day, which is an exclusively American holiday, it's not a very strong one. So once again, we must shift our perspective a little bit. Shaman's theme of gratitude comes from the Gracidia flower that it is adorned with. The Gracidia flower kind of resembles hydrangeas, which is fitting because they too symbolize gratitude in the language of flowers, and even come in a variety of colors pink included. And when it comes to their natural habitat, hydrangeas can be found both in Asia and the Americas. Another thing about hydrangeas is that they are seasonal flowers, which could foreshadow the new seasons mechanic that would be later introduced in Gen 5. But then again, all flowers are kind of seasonal, uh, so let's call this one a big stretch. And finally, we arrive at Arceus, the Alpha and the Omega, the original one. Insert other epitaphs here. Arceus is a god, obviously, but not just any god. It is the god of the Pokémon world. Arceus seems to be inspired by a variety of creator deities, one of them being Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, which is difficult to pronounce, so we're going to go with his Japanese name of Kenan. I might be mispronouncing that too. Another that Arceus seems to pull elements from is the Judeo-Christian god, the one with a capital G. And since there seems to be a Christian church located in the Sinnoh region, and the Japanese, especially up north, certainly have a history with Christianity, though not always a pleasant one, this could certainly point to many Western countries that have Christianity as their major, if not sole, religion. And since all of the regions the franchise had visited at this point have been based on Japanese locations, it would certainly have been a major departure to have the next games set in a distant land. But also also, both Arceus and Shaman could pull from the confirmed idea that Diamond and Pearl were made to be the ultimate Pokémon games. That's why they went back and added so many any new baby and final evolutions to older Pokémon. They wanted to finish up all of their ideas before moving on to something much, much bigger. Some would call this a soft reboot, a new game with none of the older Pokémon in the base game and set in a wholly different land. And what better way to finish off an arc of the Pokémon games than with their creator and ender god? And at the same time, Game Freak says thanks to the fanbase with a shaman. So both of them together sort of sign off and say goodbye to Pokémon as we knew it, hinting at just how widely different Black and White were to become. And alright, we've cleared the hurdle of the Gen 4 and 5 mythical Pokémon, and as you may have noticed, the mythical hints towards the later Gens that we were discussing, which are the earlier Gens, they were, they were weakening a bit overall. And the further back we go, this is especially apparent, as you'll see. But this makes sense, as up until a certain point, Game Freak had no idea they were going to be making another Pokémon game, so they may not have had any long-term plans. So how do you hint at a next generation if there is no next generation in mind? That being said, being a theory-based YouTuber almost, at least it used to be, that just that game theory knockoff. Most of what we do here is BS anyway, so can we fit the rest of them in with this idea? Well, sure. Generation 3 gave us Jirachi and Deoxys. Both Pokémon come from space, so I'm sure you can see how this would foreshadow the Sinnoh games, because it's all about time and space. But then where is the time then? Well, Jirachi is your time reference. Its Pokédex entries mention it sleeping for a thousand years, and its movie talks about it being related to an orbiting comet that similarly is visible repeatedly on the calendar. So there, time and space. Celebi, the voice of the forest. Almost every Pokémon entry Celebi has always brings up its relationship with forests and nature and the environment, and while all Pokémon games share a general theme centered around nature and the environment, we can all agree that the Hoenn games really put an emphasis on that, right? The Weather Trio are said to be forces of nature in and of themselves, and the plot revolves around Team Aqua and Team Magma wanting to essentially ruin the ecosystem and unbalancing nature. Bad stuff. And then finally... And we end where it all began, with Generation 1 and Mew. Mew's design just evokes... infancy. 
especially its original sprite from the Japanese versions, red and green. Whew. And yeah, it certainly looks like a fetus. Uncomfortably so. And one of the big additions given to us in Gen 2? Breeding and baby Pokémon! Wha-bam! Yeah, that definitely. If hinting at the next generation with their mythical Pokémon is a thing that Game Freak does, it's certainly a thing that didn't start until a bit later. But now I'm sure you're wondering, what does this say for Generation 9? Pokemon Sword and Shield has only added one mythical Pokemon to the mix, though I have a feeling they'll add a new one at some point with the Gen 4 remakes. But for now, all we have is Zerud. So can we use Zerud to predict something about the distant Gen 9 games that are probably coming out next year? Zerud's design seems to be based off of a mixture of gibbons, baboons, and the lion-tailed macaque. They also all make their homes in dense forests, though Zerud's signature move, Jungle Healing, suggests rainforests specifically. So it's possible that we may be looking at Gen 9 taking us to a new region that has a rainforest as one of its major defining features. And there are plenty of rainforests in the world, but what immediately comes to mind for me, and probably to most of you as well, is the Amazon rainforest, which is, for now, the biggest rainforest in the world. And this could easily hint at some region of Brazil being used. I mean, it's South America's biggest and most well-known country. But what I think would be more interesting and is sort of more likely with just this idea in mind is Ecuador. It's a smaller country, so easier to make a little Pokemon region out of it, but it's also where the Galapagos Islands are. The islands most famous because of Charles Darwin, the dude who wrote the book on evolution, and just think about how much Pokemon has to do with evolution, even if it's more so metamorphosis, but still. But other than the Amazon rainforest, there's also the Sundarbans Reserve Forest, which covers parts of India and Bangladesh, a region that is also home to gibbons and lion-tailed macaques. And Zarud's green vine wristband things are reminiscent of Indian bangles. In India, bangles are traditionally worn by women, though some men also wear them, and they can symbolize health, luck, and prosperity. The symbology also differs depending on the color, with red symbolizing energy and prosperity, and green symbolizing good luck and fertility. Health and fertility are also things sort of highlighted by Zarud's signature move as well, as its Pokémon Shield Dex entry reads, once the vines on Zarud's body tear off, they become nutrients in the soil. This helps the plants of the forest grow. And we also know that Zarud's jungle healing pulls some inspiration from orangutans, who are known to chew up vines and make medicinal poultices out of them. Orangutans are native to Southeast Asia, though not India. But the two are very close. Plus, Pokémon already has an orangutan Pokémon, Oranguru, which also pulls from Gurus, a traditionally Indian teacher. So the Pokémon world itself already has that connection. I'd actually be really excited to see an India-based region. I mean, we already have Pokémon that would be perfect for it, like Galar's Kaparaja, and India itself has already been mentioned in several deck centuries, and plus there's the whole historic connection that the United Kingdom has with India, and what with Pokémon Curry and all that too, India would be a very thematic follow-up to Galar. Plus, it would start another pattern of sorts. We got Europe, Tropics, Europe, Tropics. Or maybe Zarud isn't hinting at a location at all, but a gimmick. Perhaps a gimmick that heals your Pokémon, or you lasso Pokémon somehow, Pokémon Ranger style. Maybe the plot will do a Tarzan, which was written by an Englishman, and it'll be about living out in the wilderness on your own. So many possibilities with gimmicks. And so, there you have it, every mythical Pokémon and how they foreshadow the next games. Now, again, admittedly, Mew and Celebi most likely were not purposefully made to show foreshadow anything of the sort since Game Freak had no idea that there was going to be another Pokémon game back then. But you know that saying? Once is a chance, twice is a coincidence, three times, it's a pattern. 
I think after the 21st or 22nd time, again depending on if you consider Fiona mythical Pokemon, by that time it should pretty much be a fact. So what do you think? Which mythical Pokemon do you believe have the strongest and weakest cases for foreshadowing? I probably missed something, so you let me know that down below, and remember to never, ever stop using your noggin.